The thoughts, opinions, and general overall shade thrown on Hyatt 9 News are those of the individual speakers and not those of Hyatt 9 News, its audience, or its advertisers. The statements made do not constitute medical, legal, or financial advice. And for advice tailored to your specific situation, please consult with a licensed professional. Welcome to the Hyatt 9 News Hour, where you will hear from cannabis industry experts and professionals from around the country talk about important topics while shining light on global issues and discussing cannabis as it relates to politics, regulation and reform, data and technology, science, research and medicine, family and parenting, art, celebrities and entertainment, fitness, sports, mental health and wellness, and plant-based medicines and entheogenics. Together, we are building a stronger community, fighting the stigma and creating change. With your hosts, Jason Beck and Rico Lamite, joined by special industry expert correspondents from around the country and daily antics brought to you by Cannabis. Coming to you live every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time and high noon on the East Coast. And thank you all for getting high at nine with us. Yeah, good morning, everybody. That's right. It is Monday, April 1st, and today is National Tom Fooleries Day, you guys. It's also, yeah, yeah right, exactly. Shout out to Tom. It's also National IEP <laughs> Writing Day, National Sourdough Bread Day, you guys. Everyone's going to go to Jack in the Box for those sourdough jacks, I bet. It's also National One Cent Day. For all you people that have a penny for your thoughts, apparently. And Take Down Tobacco National Day of Action. So shout out to everyone who has quit smoking cigarettes. It's, I know it's a big, big deal to accomplish that. And uh, so good job to everyone doing that. And of course, you guys, that's right. It is April Fool's Day. So don't get tricked when it's not Halloween. And in Halloween, it is not Halloween. That's right. You're not going to get a treat. You're just going to get a trick. Ooh. Yes. Shout out to Trick Daddy. Yeah, I bet. Thank you all for joining us and getting high at nine with us. It's also high noon on the East Coast. And please remember to like, share, and subscribe to us on all social media platforms. You can look down below on your screen to see exactly where we live on the Internet. And we are live every Monday through Friday on YouTube, Rumble, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on our very own website at www.highatnightnews.com. But without further ado, we are going to kick it off to the dope dad himself, Mr. Rico Lamite, who was all suited and booted at the Women's Canna Awards and uh, is and definitely is dressed down on this Monday holiday, April Fool's Day. Apparently, he's wearing a red shirt and trying to tell us it's all orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is the dope dad himself, Mr. Rico Lamit. Oh uh, yeah, Jason. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, star-studded evening and a great affair with all the uh, the, the dope ladies in the building uh, for this past weekend. Big shout out to everybody who showed up and showed out. Uh, supported the women in the industry and um, got them awards too, man. Yeah, those winners. So, um, there were some good winners. Yeah, in, in some of them categories. Yeah. So I was like, oh yeah, good. For it them. wasn't all about indoor, despite Jason's protests. Mm. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so we're gonna uh, we're gonna get things started on a positive note today, from across the pond, and um, I got some good news from Germany. The global anti-prohibitionist movement claims yet another victory today with Germany's first official adult use regulations going into effect today. Can we get a round of applause for Germany? There, you go, there we go. I don't know how much you like those things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So the German Cannabis Association, um, which campaigned for the new law, um, uh, was celebrating and staged a smoke-in at Berlin's landmark Bradenburg Gate when the law took effect at midnight. Uh, per the Associated Press's reporting this morning, pro-cannabis campaigners uh, lit in celebratory jo uh, joints as the country liberalized uh, rules on cannabis to allow possession of small amounts. Other public consumption events were scheduled throughout the country, including one in front of uh, the Cologne Cathedral and others in Hamburg, Regensburg, and Dortmund. 
Uh, Germany's new cannabis law legalizes possession by adults of up to 25 grams. It's nearly one ounce um, of of cannabis for recreational purposes and allows individuals to grow up to three plants on their own. That part of the legislation takes effect today and German residents age 18 or older will be allowed to join nonprofit cannabis clubs with a maximum of 500 members starting July 1st. Individuals will be allowed to buy up to 25 grams a day or maximum 50 grams per month, um, a figure limited to 30 grams for people under 21. Membership in multiple clubs will not be allowed, and the club's costs will be covered by membership fees, which are to be staggered according to how much marijuana members use. AP reported that the legislation also calls for an amnesty under which sentences of cannabis-related offenses that will no longer be illegal are to be reviewed and in many cases reversed. Uh, regional authorities worry that the judicial system will be overburdened by thousands of cases. The law that um, was pushed through was by the current coalition of Chancellor Olaf Scholz's Social Democrats, the Greens, and the pro-business uh, pro Free Democrats against opposition from some of Germany's federal states, and the center-right Christian Democrats, led by Friedrich Merz. Merz, on his end, has vowed that his party will reverse the legislation when it wins national elections, as expected, in the fall of 2025. Sounds a lot like Republicans here. Leading garden stores surveyed by the DPA news agency indicated that they would not be adding cannabis plants to their horticultural offerings, and the German Medical Association also opposed the law, saying that it could have grave consequences from the uh, for the developmental and life prospects of young people in their country. I believe that this is a huge win for general access to the plant and for uh, German citizens, and of course, the right-wing politicians in Germany are drawing from the same tired rebuttals that have failed to stand up to modern science, but hey, it is what it is. I think the most interesting part of Germany's new laws are capping off at uh, these social clubs at 500 members each. Uh, I think that they will no doubt be social status linked uh, to what club you have access to. And I think uh, an unintended consequence may be the development of a cannabis caste system of sorts down the line once they begin opening in July. But congrats no less to everybody who's been fighting for this over there in Germany. I wish the best of luck to all of our friends, one on uh, on one end of the game or the other. Because, uh, you know, for the people who don't get into those clubs, there's always the trap. My name is Rico Lemit, the dopest data on the street for Hyatt 9 News. I'd like to hear from everybody else. What y'all think about Germany coming true? I mean, isn't this just a new market for Canadian boof weed? A new market for, say again? Canadian boof. Canadian boof. Because isn't Canada supplying Germany? Because they're, they're not growing it in Germany. They'll be growing it there, too. But, um, no. yeah, it's going to be a major market for Canadian yeah. uh, importing. Exactly. I feel bad for all those Germans that have to smoke Canadian weed. I feel bad for them. They Some Germans right came out right to right California and were, uh, they were touring California for when we were eventually able to export last year. When we're available, uh, eventually available to export, man, well, that's going to be years away, bro. So many years away because the Biden's talking about moving it to Schedule 3. That's not going to allow any import. We'll see. It's, we'll see, Schedule Jason. 3 ain't going to allow I, any import. You can, yeah, you can export scheduled drugs for sure. You're not, you're not going to be able to export cannabis, bro, on Schedule 3. Uh, what would happen if the uh, Republicans win here, Jason? Would that go by quicker? <laughs> Probably, everything happens faster and better under Republicans, Rico. Sure, sure. It's just like in Virginia, right? Mm -hmm. It's because yeah. it wasn't the right bill, apparently. It never is. Never is. <laughs> what do you think about this one, uh, uh, Yarrow? Well... <clears throat> I'm on. I'm kind of in one of those on the one hand, on the other hand mo yeah, moods. Um, look at this. On on the one hand, uh, look, they're only the third country in the European Union to get off blocks and to do right. something, and so I think it's important for me to celebrate that. And on the other hand, some of this feels very much like an antiquated patchwork of policies that were around prior to the end of prohibition, like clubs and not-for-profit and limiting how many members and limiting how much you can have and how much you can take and how much per month. And what about the patient who uses more than two ounces per month? And so, uh, look, Germans make great things. 
clearly cannabis policy isn't one of them. And what I just mean by that is they, um, this looks a little hodgepodge, like a sort of sausage approach, just kind of grind it up, throw it in there. Maybe this will work. Uh, I think it's, I think it's better than nothing. Uh, but I, I think that the participants will quickly come up against the limitations and failings of the this amalgamation of policy. And some of that I can see coming from a mile away and we'll be able to cover it again here. <laughs> Y Yara, would you would you call it this a wiener schnitzel? <laughs> is, is, is I'm not gonna wiener. bite on the sh on your schnitzel, Jason. It's a Monday morning, we, okay? We, we Let's just keep it at that. Bite the schnitzel. You know, okay, you're not gonna take that bait. Uh huh. It was it was power bait. You sure? You yeah. Sure? He's, he's, power he's on baited. the verge. He's on the verge. He like I can see it wanting to come out of his mouth. <laughs> Oh, my second God. cup oh, of coffee. We'll see what I say. Oh, I'm not taking it that far. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I, overall, there's, there's not enough room. There's not enough room on this news desk this morning, Jason. We're all cramped up. So. <laughs> you, you guys need to quit playing. Pussy. Get your hand in my pocket, yeah, Yarrow. Exactly. <laughs> That's not my hand. <laughs> oh man. Uh, but but I will say though overall this is good news uh, for, for for Germany like overall yeah, um, in, in light of the jokes this this is great news that Germany is is doing this going forward um, they are the largest uh, country in the European Union and so hopefully this does start to trend over there in the EU yeah and sure too. and you know look it beats a Holocaust so they're going in the right direction thank oh, you man. whoa <laughs> whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and when we said let's get roasted, we did not mean more of our our kin folks. So thank you. And we'll see what happens. Will they use these guidelines as prohibition 2.0? Will they start arresting people who have 51 grams of cannabis? Will they start giving grief to organizations that have 525 members instead of 500 members? And will they have a reasonable interpretation of not for profit and still being able to be uh, to recapture the true costs? Mm -hmm. And so, if they do it in a way that is logical and ethical and efficient, it could work. It's not going to happen. You're in a living in a dream. I'm wondering if we're going to see that tsunami of uh, Colombian weed everybody's been talking about go to Germany. Oh yeah, you're going to see season. that too. You're going to see that too. That's for sure. The, the Colombian. Very interested in, in what that looks like. That that is definitely going to be. Happening. Will it be uh, legal or the the illegal stuff you're talking about? Oh no, the Ill illegal export legal from Colombia. Colombia has been yeah. building some yeah. real huge super grows uh, with this thought that they were going to be the first to export to Germany once Germany legalized and allowed import. Yeah, they've got a they've got a lot riding on uh, uh, the EU, Colombia. They have a lot riding on their schnitzel, and on that, we're going to go to a commercial. <laughs> and we're going to be right back. Oh man, that was weird. Hey, you America! Do I look like Sean Connery? <laughs> Good morning, America. Saman Razani coming to you live from sunny Los Angeles, California with the one and only highest host, Mr. Jason Beck, smoking on the best weed in the world. Did you know that we have an audio-only version of our podcast? You can find it on Apple, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. No excuses in 2024. If you haven't checked us out, check it out now. And also, check out what The Prophet's doing in 2024. Oh, yeah, everybody. Up next, it's the Hyatt 9 News head honcho. And I got to admit, man, seeing you this weekend, Jason. Yes. Look, a brand new man. I don't know if it was the suit or if it was the uh, the, the pounds you lost, but you're looking good, brother. You're looking good. Thank you so much, Rico. It's, it's, it's definitely the pounds. It's definitely the pounds. I'm going to go and check in, get another weigh-in today after the show. You know, you know, I'm just uh, joking though, because it's April for Fools. You look like shit, Jason. Oh. You look terrible. <laughs> See, now I know that was your joke. That was your. your I just messing with you, joke. Papa Bear. It's, it's Y'all know who it is coming to the stage, Jason Beck. Oh yeah, what's up, Rico? Man, oh man, Rico, do I have a story for you today? Oh man, it's the gift that keeps on giving because from rated to rewarded. New York's unlicensed cannabis shops get a license priority 
sparking outrage, you guys. That's right. In the three years since New York has legalized adult use cannabis, the ex- explosion in unlicensed cannabis shops has drawn the most iry among, or the most eerie among legislators, law enforcement, and residents. The subject has galvanized lawmakers on both parties, Governor Kathy Hochul and stakeholders in the state's legal cannabis in- industry, prompting public outcry, new legislation proposals, and the governor calling the whole thing a disaster. But as the application for general licensing moves forward, some uh, s- some stores that have been allegedly operating illegally for a significant period of time have received higher priority for licensure, as well as proximity protection. This means that applicants who followed the rules but happened to find themselves lower on the licensing queue are now being blocked from applying for retail licenses at locations within 1,000 feet of illicit shops or 2,000 feet in less densely populated areas. In quotes, it's not fair. It's a slap in our face, said Freddie Herrera, whose businesses Gut Your Six Dispensaries is applying for a retail license. Herrera had spent over $200,000 in rent and legal fees to secure a legal cannabis dispensary storefront in Manhattan before state regulators at the Office of Cannabis Management told him his location is off limits. That's because another applicant had already claimed a location about 500 feet from Herrera's. Even though that applicant, Free Thinkers LLC, had been raided by the OCM at least twice for allegedly selling cannabis with Without a license. In quotes, I honestly think any location that has been raided more than once needs to be taken off the map completely, Herrera said. New York Cannabis Insider wasn't able to reach anyone from free thinkers to comment, and according to the OCM, those who have participated in illicit cannabis sales since the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act passed in 2021 are not eligible for licenses. In quotes, applicants found to participate in the operation of illicit, illegal cannabis dispensaries will not be recommended to the Cannabis Control Board for licensure end quote an OCM spokesperson told New York Cannabis Insider the OCM says that the regulatory review of applicants proposed locations is done separately from a review of the full application and proximity protection does not guarantee an applicant will receive a license as in the case with free thinkers they say but the idea that stores have opened illegally and never actually granted a license is a little comfort to to licensees that uh, and applicants who say they've been uh, fa- fa- fastidious in obeying OCM's rules and to others who have endured huge losses to stay on the right side of the regulators. In quotes, the people who did the right thing should have been rewarded. And I'm not sure that's what happened, said uh, Jason Ambrosio, owner of the licensed processing company Veterans Holdings, which which also runs a licensed CBD store outside of Albany called Veterans Hemp Market. In quotes, I think it just sends the wrong message to people who have done done the right thing, he says. When uh, his company was applying for a processing license in summer of 2022, OCM officials told Ambrosio that he had to remove all Delta-8 THC and hemp-derived THC products from the store shelves, he said. Regulators started raising the prospect of banning hemp-derived cannabinoids such as Delta-8 uh, less than two months after New York legalized adult use back in 2021, and the Cannabis Control Board set strict rules for cannabinoid hemp via emergency regulation in July of 2023, then by full regulation in November. Ambrosio told New York Cannabis Insider that he uh, he complied removing products that accounted for about 80% of the store sales, and as a result, Veterans Holdings is currently operating uh, the store at a loss. However, he added that the company is earning revenue from processing edibles, vapes, and other products to make up for that loss. Meanwhile, Ambrosio said a hemp store in his region has continued to sell the same intoxicating cannabinoids that the CCB banned, and the store is an applicant for a retail license and currently enjoys proximity protection. New York Cannabis Insider is not naming the store because the hemp-derived products they sold were legal until the OCM banned them via regulation and were fa- and and we found no evidence that the store has continued selling these products since January. Ambrosio said he ho- He holds no ill will toward the people who operate the store and that its proximity protection doesn't affect him since his company isn't seeking a retail license. But it does feel unfair to those who have sacrificed sales in order to comply with regulations, and it's odd that the OCM enforcing its standards evenly, he said. 
Issues surrounding enforcement are nothing new for the OCM, according to a leaked audio, which NY Cannabis Insider reported in November. OCM officials have been aware of out-of-state companies breaking regulations, but have declined to enforce their own rules. Licensed brands that have been selling, uh, selling cannabis through both legal and illegal channels, sourcing products illegally from other states, and offering overly generous terms to dispensaries, all actions that fly in the face of regulators. Uh, Damian Fagan, OCM's uh, chief equity officer, acknowledged in a recording obtained by NY Cannabis Insider that the agency is aware of brands illegally sourcing product known as Inversion and offering dispensaries unlimited time to pay back their invoices. Following a New York Cannabis Insider investigation into allegations of Fagan uh, uh, retaliating against critics, the chief equity officer is currently on administrative leave at the OCM. Now, that's a story that we covered, too, here on High at Nine News. Herrera, who is trying to open a legal dispensary in Manhattan, said he thinks the OCM officials should review whether locations have a history of alleged illegal activity and community support before providing proximity protection. And during a meeting on December 12th, Manhattan Community Board Number 1 opposed a motion to recommend free thinkers for a dispensary license in addition to concerns about the building. Uh, the board wrote, in quotes, the current location has been raided and closed down due to illegal cannabis and tobacco sales, and the landlord has allowed the business to operate there for over a year, according to the meeting's minutes. During, uh, during the same, same uh, meeting, board members approved Herrera's uh, Gut Your Six dispensaries and noted the community board found no significant objection to the application. Philip Bolden, uh, the director of public policy at Ob Albany-based lobbying firm uh, Schenker, Rosso, and Clark, said it's bad optics for the OCM to protect locations for applicants with a history of alleged legal sales. And it's even worse. Uh, Bolin said that regulators won't allow Herrera to apply with his location approved by a community board because the agency provided proximity protections to another dispensary, which the same community board rejected. In quotes, it's not a great look to elevate someone who continues to do uh, a runaround of the law, said said Bolin, who is represent who represents Herrera. However, he acknowledged that it's challenging for regulators to create a foot uh, a, a foolproof method to completely avoid alleged illegal shops from advancing through the licensing process. So they're basically saying they can't stop it. It's uh, complicated. There are thousands of people who put in applications, and there are certainly going to be some bad actors, Bolin said. People are going to slip through the cracks. Bolin is optimistic that Herrera's situation will eventually work out in his favor, but Herrera both expressed frustration that, the store, uh, that a store that has experienced multiple raids was given proximity protection in the first place. Herrera said that he's not interested in battling unlicensed shops. He just doesn't want his application blocked by one and in quotes it says i don't care if ocm turns around uh, turns around to them and says go find a different location herrera said but it's not fair to me and it's not fair to other applicants who are doing the right thing he says well 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 i mean new york has a history of not doing the right thing when it comes to is cannabis and i seriously doubt that they're going to start doing the right thing but nonetheless i can't wait to hear what you guys have to say and this is jason beck for the high at nine news what do you <coughs> think about this well yeah there's a little bit to unpack here for starters i do not agree with herrera who says that anybody who's been raided should be disqualified being raided doesn't mean there was any merit to the raid and so unless there's a post raid fact finding process or an independent arbiter of information decides that that place was out of compliance or broke the rules the the mere notion that the raid itself would disqualify a store to me on its face seems like it doesn't include enough uh due process the other thing about herrera is he said he spent two hundred thousand dollars on legal and rents before he found out that he was what we call radiused out by the 500 feet, <clears throat> you should have talked to me, dog. I would have helped you lower your startup costs prior to figuring out that there was a location less than 500 feet away that would disqualify. So while that is unfortunate, that is also something that is avoidable. Not the legal fees, 
and the legal fees, articles of incorporation, entities, blah, blah, blah. That's going to apply no matter where you're doing business. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you are a quarter million in before uh, you this, this, this notion that there was a nearby pen, permit pending retailer that would disqualify that location, some of that is avoidable. Doesn't mean I don't feel bad, but it does mean that some of this, you know, people look at their their losses or their costs to date and they say look look i've got this much in and yeah you do have this much in and how much of that is is, is based on proper execution best practices and how much of that is and i don't know mm -hmm. um the thing that's really challenging is uh we know that prohibition doesn't work we know that pitting regulated against unregulated is probably not going to work and we know that New York itself has an obligation to stand up aggressively enough retail locations to handle the compliant biomass that's coming out of Nemdar Hills uh, because of the hemp farmers that, that, that were converted. And New York has done a terrible job. And so um, I can understand why these people who have tried to participate and do the right thing, mm -hmm. deal with the, from the top of the deck and not cut any corners, are feeling frustrated. I just... I've always said that I think the bodegas are a symptom of a lack of uh, coherent regulated opportunity. Uh, and so I just, I, I think that, I don't think enforcement against bodegas is gonna make a hill of beans difference. I think creating a coherent, profitable regulated industry helps for all of it. Fair enough. Rico, what do you think about this, Rico? You're on mute, Rico. You're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. So the traps stay winning, the traps especially stay in uh, New York. Yeah. Period. Exactly. The traps gonna stay winning. I don't think. I don't think this is really gonna uh, do anything. It's more, you know, uh, more of the same we're seeing from there. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. For all of these governments, uh, the sooner all these governments just start treating this like a, a, a consumer good, and less like this highly radioactive, deadly destructive evil uh i think it's everybody because in doing so you place with the regulations the the financial burden the tax burden it's a legal system out of reach from for most people who can still man everybody's been going to their cousin their uncle their friend down the block or like in new york to these bodegas for decades mm -hmm. and it's really hard to all of a sudden convince somebody to pay two to three times as much for for a lower quality weed like how does that make sense very true very true and and and, Yara, and and I'll go ahead, Yara. And, and I just think you know it's tough for for regulators because on the one hand they need to provide opportunity that the regulated market provide that the that the unregulated market can't provide, and on the other hand there needs to be a path for people who are operating in, in a way that is outside of the current guidelines to be able to operate inside the current guidelines, and there needs to be a little bit of feeling, uh, okay, that didn't check out, but let's get you. Let's get you into the system here. Let's get you compliant. I, I think when we look at these bodegas, again, they are a symptom. They're not the problem. The demand for cannabis in New York exists, and that demand has been met for a very long time and will continue to be met with or without coherent regulated opportunities. And so the quicker we can say, let's bring all of this under, under a regulated roof, let's make sure we've got safe products let's take a little bit of taxes mm -hmm. everybody wins yeah and and you know uh yarrow you, you brought up a very excellent point i just want to reiterate that the lack of due process in in regards with what these gentlemen are saying i totally agree with your statement just because uh, there is a raid doesn't necessarily mean there was a crime or they found evidence of that crime there and just doesn't mean anything well, it, does, it doesn't, doesn't. It does mean something. It doesn't mean. It could have got swatted. Well, no, no. It, yeah. it, it, it means that you're not going to be in in, 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 in operational while the raid is going on. So you're going to have a loss of revenue for that time. What I, what I mean is that anybody can call up and say that you are planning a terrorist attack and you have minors that you're sex trafficking in the in the in, in the back of a shop. I mean, anybody can make any horrendous allegation. Mm -hmm. I got swatted one time, uh, one time in my, in my business. Yeah. That, that has definitely happened. That has I, definitely happened. What's that, Yara? It's, it, it I can say for, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
just to you're cutting out you're cutting out a little yarrow but uh, i was just saying that that say for... on I, i'm not sure you keep on cutting out yarrow you keep i'm getting like i'd like to word from you. add that that so cut don't you agree jason that's weird because i'm getting the same thing from you uh Matthew St. Germain. I was just I was just doing it on purpose. Oh, you were doing it? Okay, cool, cool, cool. I was tripping <laughs> out for a second. All right, all right. Fair enough, fair enough. We're going to roll right on to, into Mr. Matthew St. Germain, who likes to have jokes today since it's April Fool's Day. He's a, he's a prankster, and he is the immortal man himself. That's right. It is none other than Mr. Team Pleasant himself, Matthew St. Germain. <laughs> It's Brother Jason, Yarrow, you who had to sign off, and everybody out there. We've got a really cool story about a California bill that is upcoming, that is set to legalize psychedelic services, and they've been adding some amendments to it in committees uh, ahead of an expected vote next month. A partisan bill to legalize psychedelic service centers in California has been amended in a number of different ways. Supporters prepare for an, unexpe for an expected committee hearing next month. Regulated Therapeutic Access to Psychedelics Act which would allow adults 21 and older to uh, access psilocybin, MDMA, mescaline, and DMT in a supervised environment with trained facilitators, has undergone a series of mostly technical changes as well as certain key regulatory revisions. Sponsored by Senator Scott Weiner and Assemblymember Marie Waldron, the legislation has been drafted in a way that's meant to be responsive to concerns voiced by old Governor Gavin last year when he vetoed a broader proposal that included provisions to legalize low-level possession of substances such as psilocybin. Among the main changes to the bill that were adopted last week is new language to establish a Division of Regulated Psychedelic Therapy under the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency that would be specifically tasked with regulating the psychedelics program. The measure was also amended to create a Board of Regulated Psychedelic Facilitators in the State Department of Consumer Affairs to oversee and license trained facilitators to provide the services. Public Education and Harm Reduction Fund would also be created to support efforts to educate the public about the potential benefits and risks of psychedelics. Under the bill as amended, the governor would be responsible for making appointments to the proposed Expert Oversight Committee. The legislation was also revised to clarify that psychedelics covered under the measure could only be used in the context of a regulated facilitation at approved locations. Other mostly technical changes included clarifications around data collection requirements, Definitional changes, the removal of duplicative language, and uh, facilitator enforcement provisions. Main difference in the overall legislation is compared to the bill that the governor vetoed last year that the earlier proposal sought to remove criminal pen penalties for psychedelics possession outside of the regulated service context. That said, the current measure does not lay out any specific qualifying medical conditions that a person must have in order to access the services. Senator told Marijuana, Marijuana Moment last week that he still expects the bill will receive consideration in a committee hearing next month. It's been referred to three separate panels. Meanwhile, Waldron, the lead on the assembly side, is sponsoring a separate psychedelics bill focused on promoting research and creating a framework for the possibility of regulated therapeutic access that has already moved through the assembly this year with unanimous support. Uh, to me, this is just a real great movement in the right direction. Access to psychedelics is a good thing for our communities. And I'm excited to see this thing making its way through committee. Uh, a little bit of a bummer that uh, low-level psychedelic um, uh, 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 targeting has still not been taken off the table. However, for most people with with uh, an abundance of traumas, a low level of education about psychedelics probably is better for them to have a facilitated experience for maybe their first experience. And what do you, Yara, what do you and Jason think about this uh, this story? I just feel like these, they, like once this passes, then everyone's going to start opening up. You know, like they started opening up the ketamine clinics. They're going to start opening yeah. up the fun guy clinics, and then so then that way they can say that they're giving this type of an experience. But even people that just have no, no, uh, no schooling in how to do that, or or past experience in doing that. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a rush of, of, yeah. of people to, to come in, and that's kind of how the business space works, though, you know, as everybody gets an opportunity to do so. It's called uh, find a need and fill it, right? And There you and, go. And so here's the thing, right? When we're talking about psychedelics, things that could make you see things, 
things that might lead to judgment that might not be so safe and sustainable. The idea that you would have a trained facilitator or guide is sound policy, it's practical applications, and it's consistent with the way in which indigenous communities took psychedelic plant medicines going back thousands of years. Nobody just took a heroic dose and went off into the woods. People had guides. They had people who were experienced in these things who were making sure that they were going through the process in a way that was safe and sane and sensible. So the idea that we would do that, to me, doesn't seem like it's uh, cutting edge. It just seems like we're saying, okay, we want to decriminalize these people to be able to take these psychological, spiritual journeys. And we want to make it that they're not climbing the top of the bridge and thinking like a swan. So I love all of this and I make money on this. Begin cutting the industry. And it's just whatever abilities operate. Whatever margin the we also just Get, we're mi we're missing you, Yarrow. Yeah, yeah, we're getting like, every other word from well, you. Yarrow. We're getting a short on your mic. I'm sorry, because yeah. you're making great points. Can, can you hear but, me now? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? Better, that's much better. Yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say is that what cost is to to facilitate these. I just want to make sure that as we are thinking about plant medicine and adopting ways for people to evolve and shift their thinking consciousness that while these facilities are going to be likely be very expensive it's also important to think about low cost people who might not have thousands and thousands of dollars and i just want to make sure that as we that it isn't just for the well to do that it is for the rich it isn't just for certain tax brackets and so if they charge a lot of money for these facilities i would just hope that they allocate like some scholarship type model so that other people can also go to these new facilities and back from the treatment place. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and they are going to have a policy, uh, a regulatory body to uh, certify folks who would be facilitators. So there will be some sort of, there will be some sort of, 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 of regulatory uh, criteria. So maybe that, you know, that'll lead to both better experiences as well as not just anyone at all rushing in case. I would also hope that they would use some sort of, uh, Psychologist on on the board or on the uh, staff of each, mm -hmm. uh, uh, each of these businesses in order to just protect the mental health of, of folks who are doing it. Um, and, and going back to you know, the fact that maps, uh, as well as the ketamine clinics and all these different modalities that are that are that are emerging, are all charging thousands and thousands of dollars for the treatment. Uh, while I don't agree with that as a model points to the that sore spot that is our current system you know we live in a system that is designed to aggregate wealth in hands as possible and, and is designed also to cater to the rich and and uh as well as providing prejudice to the the not so well to do so really continue every every one of these stories that we see continues to point to the same thing which is that the system that we're enmeshed in is not actually working and functioning for the vast majority of people and we really need to get back to the drawing board on this somehow. Mm. Is that going to happen ever? Don't know. No, I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. But on that, we're going to go to a commercial. We're going to be right back. Thank you so much for that, Matthew. The control tower from Highly Educated has perfected the dab. Utilizing the concept of thin film evaporation, you can waste none of it and taste all of it. The micro texture of the SE pillar increases nucleation at elevated temperatures. And with the tower propelling at 2600 RPMs, it's certainly the most efficient dab experience to date. The control tower from Highly Educated. Oh yeah, stop whatever you're doing. Make sure you hit that like button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed already. And all of the stories that we cover on today's show, you can read directly on our website at www.highatnightnews.com. I'm Jason Beck, and this is Smokey Vanilla. And if you, you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to get a stretch and smoke with Smokey Vanilla. 
Hi, I'm Smokey Vanilla. I have my bachelor's degree in kinesiology, and I'm a sports massage therapist and stretch coach. I focus mostly on individuals that are in sport with chronic pain or injury. I love to intuitively create a, and customize a session based on the individual that I'm working with. We'll go over a few postural assessments, work together to create a wellness journey based on the health history, past injuries, or anything still affecting you today. And we'll get you back on your feet right away with less pain. Me. We're about to stretch and then we're gonna smoke because we're gonna get on our stretch and smoke. Me. If you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to come on down and get a stretch and smoke with none other than Smoky Vanilla. Me. Oh, yes, and we're back, and we're going to roll right into the Sebastopol Sage himself. That's right. It's Mr. Yarrow Kubrin, who does real estate. He does cannabis, and every now and again, he does cannabis and real estates and secures a big, big bag for the house. That's right. Sipping on his tea this morning. That's right. Is none other than Mr. Yarrow Kubrin. I mean, the intros have gotten better. They've gotten better. <laughs> sorry, well, sorry, sorry, you come into this about nine months. You. Um, they've, you might intro would be really, really. Uh, or that Jason would know I don't drink tea. I drink coffee. But um, it's good enough. Oh, so you only sip tea? I sip tea. Okay. Well, right. And it's tea appropriate. But mornings, mornings are me. Press. Coffee, huh? So speaking of the press, let, uh, let's let's go to my article here. Monday, April 1st. I wish I had some great April 1st. Um, but I do have a joke of an article. <laughs> Justice Department expects influx part setting target requests. Uh, you gotta get closer to the mic. The Justice Department office one one second here. I will it's your connection, Yaro. Worst April Fool's joke ever. You yeah. yeah, yeah. Worst April Fool's joke ever. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Go for it, Yaro. Go oh goodness right, gracious! Okay, without further ado, Justice Department expects influx of marijuana pardon certificate applications, setting targets to quick process requests. This was published today by Kyle Yeager, a Marijuana Moment. The Justice Department Office of the Pardons Attorney Pardon says it's expecting an influx of applications for marijuana pardons under the president's clemency and is setting a target to process at least 80% of them within 30 days of their submission. In a budget report for the 2025 fiscal year, the pardon attorney's office said it expects to continue incoming clemency cases, both from ordinary case submissions and through President's cannabis pardon proclamations that he issued in 2022 and 2020. Notably, while the marijuana clemency action made to have 15,000 people, the office said that as of February, only 100 gets been issued. That's because they have Kathy Hochul issuing them. <laughs> An oh, FAQ oh. section on the Justice Department website says it's 184 certificates as of the last update, however. Certificate is granted to the only pardon conduct to verify that the risk was pardoned pursuant to the president's proclamations. Pardons attorney's office said in its budget in a recent request to the White House seeking approval to update its data collection process related to marijuana pardon certificates. DOJ office said that a reasonable projection is that there will be 1,500 applicants annually from the certificate. <laughs> That means if they have 13,000 and they do 1,500 a year, they've built in eight years of bureaucracy. Oh, boy. Yara. The new budget document also shows that the office target do at least 80% of the marijuana pardon certificate in 30 days. It's unclear how pardon is coming along to that end. It's been one year since the DOJ lost certificate application. So far, only 184 have been issued. That suggests that either the office expected to swell in the... Yaro. Yarrow. Yep. Yeah, you keep you, we're, we're we're getting you cutting in and out again, but we get we we, we get the just we get the, oh, we dang get, we, 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 we get the just of this. So basically, 
the White House is gaslighting everybody, saying that they're going to be bogged down with so many petitions for, 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 for a pardon because of the actions that they took, which no one is getting out of jail for, correct? And 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 they're just, no one's getting out of jail. Exactly, and, and and so they're just they're just getting. They're, oh, we're gonna have our workload is gonna be so so heavy because all these people are just like, what do they think they're doing? Like like they're not they're not giving away money like PPE money again. Is anyone in federal prison for smoking weed? No, no. Thing, well, there are people it's in federal prison ridiculous. smoking weed though. At that totally. There is that. So I. I I'd love, I'd love to just sort of add some context to this. When, when Biden made these two announcements in 2022 and 2023, those of us who've studied cannabis policy for more than a minute recognize that this was nothing more than grandstanding optics, yep. pandering to mm-hmm. whatever base he thinks he's going to be able to benefit from when it comes time for re-election. And his vice president has done a fantastic job saying a lot about them doing Mm-hmm. And so when these 13,000 eligible uh, pardon opportunities came, to Matthew's point, we pointed out, highlighted how the practical effect of this change was going to be little to none, and that most people who are serving time in federal prison cannabis are not serving time for simple possession. And that, frankly, nothing about cannabis has ever been simple or or such that a supply chain would lead itself towards somebody having just possession conviction and then they came out and they trumpeted this certificate and teased them on this show about like the certificates that people get when their kid makes the month and how this thing we hoped it might have a little bit of gold foil or some embossing on the edges and so now they've got this thirteen thousand maximum they've processed less than 200 they're talking about processing things for up to eight years and the thing that comes to mind for me is the way in which government creates its own blow to bureaucracy. Is there not a way to be automatically done through some type of automation, systemization, doesn't require any sort of interaction with the recipient, and they just get done and then get shot out? Or like when you lose some money, the state of California says, okay, we've got to come to us. Mm-hmm. Awesome money. You're cutting again. Six years like later, high in acid, you guys. Yeah. Six years later, can you hear me now? No, we. Not, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. You just we, uh, we hear you. We, terrible. And, and then you so cut out. So the point is, these certificates matter not at all, and nobody is going to take the certificate and use it to get a better interest rate on a mortgage. Yeah. No one's going to take the certificate and use it to get a job. So the certificates are of symbolic benefit. At and so if we create big bureaucracies to process symbolic benefits, it's what has government actually done for the people who were most harmed and most impacted? And the answer is eh, nothing. They've gaslit them. Yeah. They've gaslit them and, and they and they have chosen at the same time too to stand on all of their pain and suffering and try to proclamate some great grandioso gesture that is trying to help people that 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 really isn't that big of a deal? No, it's not. What are you going to say, Matthew? I see it. I see it coming. I'd just like to see them pardoning people who are actually in prison for. Agreed. Uh, totally. I'd like to see Biden go after the guy who's still stuck in Russia for cannabis. Yeah. I mean, if they want to. I mean, if they want to do some things, they could do some things. There is, there is some things. There is some things that they can do. And there's some things we can do, too. And we're going to go to do that and go to a commercial. We're going to be right back. Get ready for the return of the shit show to Los Angeles. Returning Friday, May 3rd, 7 p.m. to midnight at a brand new venue. Comedy sets by comedians such as Demi York, Lindsay Ames, Alyssa Phillips, Chris Thayer, Josh Shakespeare, Fumi Abi, Jay Snow, Brent Weinbach, Chris Kelly, and hosted by none other than Abdullah Saeed. So head over to www.cloudmedia.partners now to get your tickets, and we'll see you there. All right, all right, you guys. I got two, 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 two stories, and 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 we're out of here today. Are you guys, are you guys ready? Yes. I think you guys are gonna like this. This one is super, super interesting, you guys. 
It's out to my friends out in Michigan. Why BetterMade is suing several Michigan marijuana companies, you guys. BetterMade is suing companies behind several Michigan marijuana dispensaries that's, that they say are selling products with an altered or unauthorized version of the snack food company's logo. The popular Mich Michigan potato chip company filed a lawsuit Wednesday, March 27th, against nearly 20 companies and the marijuana dispensaries they operate in the state. Better Made says the businesses are selling a cannabis product labeled Better Smoke, whose logo is a spin of their own. Better Made claims to use to to use of their uh, distinct logo design by Better Smoke is is damaging to their brand since customers may wrongly assume the cannabis products are affiliated with the food company. The defendants named in the lawsuit are being accused of federal trademark infringement and dilution among other things or excuse me, dilution among other things and included among the defendants are several companies and their dispensaries from all across uh, all across Michigan from Traverse County to Grand Rapids to Adrian and throughout Metro Detroit. Better Made is asking the court to make these companies give all of their profits from Better Smoke products to the actual snack foods company, you guys. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. It's clear that the Better Smoke logo is a play on Better Made's iconic design, which has been around since 1930. But trademark parodies are actually pretty common among cannabis products at at, um, at, at least Michigan's dispensaries. Here's a look at trademark parodies and why Better Made may have an actual case, you guys. The makers of Better Smoke um, aren't directly using Better Made's logo. They are, however, using a nearly identical design, but with different words that indicate they are selling a different product under <coughs> a different name. This is what's known as a trademark parody. When someone reuses an existing brand or logo in a way that is humorous, satir uh, satirical, or critical of the original brand, this practice is largely done with logos or bonds that are or bands that are widely known. Parodies or uh, of other creations like songs and films may be more common or at least more familiar, but for the most part, they are legal too. So long as the parodies are on an exaggerated or creative or comedic take on someone's work that, that's meant to critique or comment on that work, it appears that Better Smoke's packaging and name are meant to be a, a, a humorous take on Better Made's brand, but that depends on who you ask. At some point, uh, Better Smoke's logo featured a marijuana plant leaf rather than a Better Made's specific shape, though it's unclear when the brand brand uh, when the branding was released. There is a legal line when, when it comes to parodies, especially with trademark parodies, and a trademark is known as a, in quotes, source identifier, which is a word, phrase, logo, slogan, general appearance, or another item or concept that I literally identifies the source of a good service or of a goods or service, you guys. Trademarks are meant to protect and verify a product's uh, source for consumers, such as Nike Swoosh or Adidas Three Stripes. And when a shopper sees those designs, they know what brand or product is to associate it with. Those designs or whatever constitu constitutes the trademark are also referred to as marks. In this case, Better Made argues that Better Smoke's logo uses its actual conf use is actually confusing to consumers, which is a considered a viable claim for trademark infringement. Better Made claims the parody logo can cause buyers to be unsure about where the product originates. But because uh, the logos are so similar, Better Made argues that uh, consumers might incorrectly believe the cannabis products and the food company products are affiliated with one another. The defendant's actions deprive uh, Better Made of the ability to control consumer perception of its goods and services offered under its Better Made marks, placing the valuable, uh, va valuable goodwill and reputation of Better Made into the, hands of, into the hands of defendants, the lawsuit reads. The snack food company also argues Better Smoke's version of uh, and utilization of nearly identical design uh, dilutes Better Made's dis distinctiveness as a brand. That is a that it, that is considered a viable argument for federal trademark uh, dilution. And in the lawsuit, Better Better Made specifically calls 
without defendants house house brands distro a cannabis distribution company in michigan that makes better smoke products the lawsuit alleges that house brands distro willfully violated uh better maids rights by manufacturing distributing and selling products using a logo design that is unmistakable reputation of the better maids design and better made claims its branding has uh, become famous for over the nearly the last hundred years and that the defendants have used it without authorization because those behind better smoke are making money from their products they may be given less leeway than if their designs were for non-commercial use experts say and uh the snack food company is asking the court to take several actions in response to the lawsuit. Better Made wants the defendants barred from using their design without author- authorization, and the court is uh, being asked to force the marijuana dispensaries to destroy all product labor- labels, literature, online content, and advertising materials that feature the Better Smoke logo called into question. The plaintiff wants uh, all defendants to account for and pay to Better Made all profits derived by defendants resulting from their use of the Better Maids marks. The lawsuit reads, and those behind uh, Better Smoke aren't the only ones manufacturing or selling cannabis products with brands that look familiar. And this article goes on and on to name a whole bunch of them, but we're not going to go into that in the sake of time. What do you guys have to say about this? Better Smoke, Better Brands. Is it actually better weed, you guys? Yeah, you you have to only do that on the trap side. We've been watching this, you know, Gorilla Glue turned into GG4. <laughs> Bills is now the original Z. Yep. I mean, you just you can't do that. Hold on. French laundry <laughs> is now the strain formerly known as French laundry. <laughs> I mean, this Ridiculous. is I don't feel sorry for these people at all. You put those up side by side. Mm-hmm. Like you're telling me you're a weed company and this is the pinnacle of your creative go to market strategy. Like, give me a break. I mean, the only thing I can criticize the original company for is in a perfect world, they would be giving away all of the proceeds from the winning of this lawsuit. Anything above their legal fees, they'd be giving to some worthy charity like single mothers with children that have a lazy eye. I don't know. I would like to see, because they're going after all the money earned, that they recognize that the exercise here is not the disgorgement of the profits, but to slap somebody so hard on the wrist that other companies take notice and stop doing it. And that's the problem that's so challenging, as Matthew's pointed out, is that we have a history time and time again of this not working out so well for companies, and yet companies are still doing it. And it's just, it, it's sad to the investors, it's sad to the employees, it's sad to everybody who's put money into standing up these businesses that 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 founders and d would not de-risk their decisions to make them less vulnerable to these types of lawsuits because all you gotta do is put those up side by side. Any reasonable civil juror like, uh, yeah, you're biting on those people's trademark. Yeah. This is like a slam dunk. Mm-hmm. I feel I feel you. Um, I just, you know, I- it's it's so common in cannabis for people to to do these uh to, to to do these types of things but i wonder is is the weed actually better or good and my second part of it um because that that could possibly be be a defense for them they could be like hey this is a true parody because we're just selling straight mids in these bags you know what i mean <laughs> and, and 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 i do find it funny that that this better brands doesn't have a clue about cannabis because in the lawsuit it says that they want to sue them for all of the profits that they've made off of selling this product but everyone in cannabis knows there's no profit made off of selling the product you make profit off of selling the packaging and so therefore uh. <laughs> therefore these guys are barking up the wrong tree and they're going to get s- stuck with the short end of the stick even if they win uh. This history of borrowing from brands is is the trap culture. And in that context, I don't think it was damaging or as damaging as something that's going on the shelves in a brick and mortar store. Um, I'm not angry at the trap culture. Imitation is the best form of flattery. I am angry at that that all translates and they can do that because it's it's really dumb it's really dumb i agree i i I agree and uh we're gonna roll into this last story you guys were right at the top of the hour so we'll try to power through this 
Uh, to turn into a pumpkin, yes. but I'm going to love you guys. Oh, we love you, bro. We love you. Maine lawmakers support sealing. This is a good news story for you guys. Maine lawmakers support sealing past marijuana convictions, but not automatically, you guys. A proposal to seal past conviction records for minor marijuana offenses won the approval of a Maine legislative committee last week and now heads to the full legislature. The proposal LD2336 would effectively shield the public view minor offenses committed prior to the legalization of the drug. It was backed 11 to 3 by members of the Judiciary Committee and now advances to the floor uh, f- the floor votes in the House and Senate. In quotes, I think we've had people who have been unjustly incarcerated and had their lives destroyed by the war on drugs broadly, but also the war on cannabis specifically, said Senator Eric Brakey. Oh, yeah, shout out to Eric Brakey. That's a friend of mine, Republican from Auburn, who uh, voted to support the bill. Creating a pathway to seal records doesn't make up for that, but it does potentially allow at least some people who are unjustly prosecuted to move forward. The bill, which came uh, came forward in response to recommendations from the state's Criminal Records Review Committee, would allow people with convictions for lower-level marijuana cultivating or possession to appeal to a court to have their records sealed. The list of eligible offenses is limited to things that are now legal or were based on former statutes, and the crimes would need to have been committed prior to legalization of marijuana in Maine in, of Maine in January of 2017. A majority of of committee members rejected another bill which resulted uh, from the records review committee's findings that would allow people with low-level marijuana possession and cultivation crimes to have those records automatically sealed. Ten committee members uh, said that that uh, bill shouldn't pass, while a bipartisan minority of four lawmakers backed passage of the bill with an amendment that the same list of marijuana-related crimes eligible for sealing by a judge would also be eligible for automatic sealing. The proposal will still be voted on by the full legislature and the main judicial branch of the branch and state bureau of identification both testified against the automatic sealing bill, saying it would take significant time and resources to automatically. Seal the records in question. The Maine Press Association also testified against the bill. Representative Adam Lee, a Democrat from Auburn, said he was concerned about the logistics of enacting the bill and was moved by the Press Association's argument that the automatic sealing of the records would be a First Amendment violation and reduce government transparency. But Representative Matthew Beck, Democrat from South Portland, who uh, and no relation to me, who voted with the minority, said he worries that the process of appealing to a judge would be easier for people who have greater access to information and legal representation. In a quote, the people at the low end of the economic ladder who are struggling and are likely going to be left out because they just don't know about it, he said. A majority of the committee also voted this week to support two other bills that came out of recommendations from the records review. One is LD2218, which would remove the cap in current law that only allows adults aged 18 to 27, not anyone older, to have a minor criminal record sealed by a judge. They also endorsed LD2252, which would establish the Criminal Records Review Committee as a permanent commission. And the committee was established in 2021 as a temporary body to explore ways to help people who have been convicted of crimes and serve their sentences to become productive community members without their convictions holding them back. And Governor Janet Mills submitted testimony against all four bills, though they have since undergone amendments. If the governor were to veto any of the bills, a two-thirds vote of the legislature would be needed to override the veto. And Maine is one of the uh, Maine, Maine is one of at least 31 states that have legalized, decriminalized the adult use of cannabis, and many of those states uh, have since re-examined the way they treat criminal offenses related to the drug. About two dozen states have expungement or sealing law specific to marijuana offenses, you guys. Any thoughts, Yarrow, on this? Uh, my thoughts align with what I had said earlier about the certificate or the pardon and certificate program with the government, which is that anytime you have one of these processes, if it's not automated, if it's not just done systematic, I think it creates a lot of administrative and bureau burden. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, the tax 
footsie the bill for. And so I'm in favor of these processes and not in favor of requiring individual beneficiaries to have to interact with the government in order to receive this outcome slash benefit. And so the idea around this First Amendment right and violating free speech uh, by, by sealing these records, I think is absolutely outweighed by the public benefit of reducing the cost process uh, the the records of all the people who would benefit from this change. I wish the article had indicated to us how many people could be affected uh, by this. And I wish that when people thought about changing laws to benefit the greatest number of citizens, they do it in a way where that system systemization, that automation is not born on the back of the recipients. I'll give you a perfect example. Back in the day, back in the Paleolithic era of regulated cannabis six or some odd years ago, the district attorney in Sonoma County decided to do an expungement and decided not to just automatically do it, which would have meant that people were going and contacting the courts and doing this for themselves and figuring that out and calling tech support and all that back and and assistant district attorneys were going to have to process these in court and blah, 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 blah. And then the district attorney of San Francisco came up with a similar program or already had a similar program, but had it automated, systematized so that nobody had to do anything. It existed. They were going to process it. And it was what it was. Mm -hmm. And the district attorney in Sonoma County pivoted, folded like a lawn chair and changed her position to also automate these processes and systems. So this isn't like a new concept around how we, we, we get these changes enacted. And so I think the idea that it's a violation of First Amendment and free speech, I'm not, I'm not feeling that at all. I think it's progress, and progress needs to be automated. If, 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 if I have a dishwasher and I have a Roomba, Y'all can figure out how to do it on the law side and not have individual citizens have to go back. Because what that lawmaker said about it disproportionately impacting people at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum and and the, and the, the, the burden to them is, in my mind, absolutely accurate and, and can be avoided. Yeah, no, I, I think I think overall this is good. I mean, I'm not surprised to hear that the that the governor uh, did this. And I, I do want to send a good shout out to my to my buddy, Eric Brakey. I'm. Glad, glad you were quoted in that article. I know you do a lot for uh, for freedom up there in Maine. So shout out to Eric Brakey, and uh, and hopefully this hopefully this gets passed, and hopefully with a two thirds majority. So then that way we don't have to worry about whether or not the uh, governor is going to veto it or not. That's my take on it. Yeah, that was you, you, and you do a good job reading the articles, not just uh, uh, reciting them, because to your point, the governor had indicated that the four bills of oh, which yeah. this was included weren't going to fly and so that's that's equally distressing to me well, well i i just think i just think it actually is is a good thing like like if i was a legislator because because that would motivate me to make sure that i knew that i needed to get a different number as opposed to just a passing number of delegates to 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 vote on its behalf and so so at least you know where you stand and what you what what numbers you need to hit as your threshold um, in order to move the bill forward, because otherwise you just stall the bill out and just wait for wait, wait until it, it can get passed. And that's generally how government works. Whatever it takes for progress, I just want to make sure that we're not going through the motions. And some of these things are just theatrical grandstanding. And so uh, legislation that's proposed where there's not clear line of sight on uh, something bipartisan coming out the, the tail end of that process uh, mm -hmm. always alarms me. I, I want to see stuff get done. And this doesn't seem like it's a big lift. This is not a big ask. Mm -hmm. To me, this is something that should be done both federally and at the state level for every state. Fair enough. Fair enough. And on that, we are going to wrap 
this show up. Thank you all for joining us and getting high at 9 with us every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific and high noon on the East Coast. Big thank you to our audience and supporters for tuning in daily and listening to the insanity that is the developing cannabis industry. Thank you, Yarrow, Matthew St. Germain, Rico, all coming in today this Monday. It is the most important day of the week. Huge thank you to all of our sponsors, and thank you all for tuning in and getting high at 9 with us. We are America's number one daily cannabis news show.